of all the types of uh, electron cryo microscopy at the moment, uh, elect single particle electron cryo microscopy is probably the most powerful and most uh, successful at this moment. Um, but uh, in the longer term, all the different applications of electron cryo microscopy, tomography, um, cellular work, will ha have, have, have un unfulfilled pot potential. But uh, the single particle uh, methodology, uh, you could argue, started with before cryo microscopy, before Jacques Dubochet's method for plunge freezing samples and making cryo specimens. Uh, a couple of groups, um, Joachim Frank's group, which uh, he was a student in Germany with Walter Hoppe, and then Marin van Heel, who was a student in the Netherlands with Ernie van Bruggen, they began uh, working originally probably on ribosomes and other uh, large uh, biological structures uh, using a method where um, heavy metal stains were used to embed the molecules. Uh, that avoided the need to freeze them, it avoided the radiation damage problems. And they did early work at low resolution um, on these single particles. In parallel, there was work on uh, helical arrangements and icosahedral virus particles at the MRC Molecular Biology Lab uh, here in Cambridge. And so these two traditions were the early beginnings of, you could call, uh, electron microscopy structural biology. Um, but uh, with uh, cryo microscopy coming in uh, following the Dubochet plunge freezing methods, it became clear around about the mid 80s that uh, this was going to be a very powerful method. We actually had a student uh, at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology called Guy Weigers, who went to a course organized by Jacques Dubochet at the European Molecular Biology Lab in Heidelberg, where they give the very first uh, tuition in plunge freezing and electron cryo microscopy. And when he returned from this course, he said, this is the future, I'm giving up my project. So he stopped working on the project that uh, we had given him. I was one of his two supervisors and he started to do single particle cryo electron microscopy in about 1985. And then there were a few papers uh, from Dubochet's group on the structure of adenovirus particles, on the structure of semliki borist virus particles. Uh, other people at the European Molecular Biology Lab uh, published cryo-EM structures of bacterial virus tails. Uh, Weigers, our student at the MRC Molecular Biology Lab, published the structure of clathrin coats, which is the protein coat that surrounds vesicles in, as part of cellular secretion mechanism. But uh, these um, original cryo-EM studies were limited in resolution, 40 angstroms resolution, 50. That means low resolution, rather blobby structures. So you're not getting anywhere near uh, atomic structures where you could see the atoms of the molecules, which is of course the ultimate goal of structural biology is to find out the atomic structure of everything in biology. Uh, my own involvement in this was to use cryo microscopy to study the structure of two-dimensional crystals and we were able to find about, about 1990 an atomic structure for this protein bacteria rhodopsin that we worked on, which formed two-dimensional crystals. But it became clear uh, to me and to others, and we switched around about 1995 from working on electron crystallography, that means cryo-EM of 2D crystals, to working on single particles. So for about 20 years now, we've focused on why is it that single particle electron microscopy did not originally immediately give you atomic structures. And it is because of technical problems with the, mi the microscopes weren't very good, the vacuums were bad, the brightness of the sources were bad, um, the detectors for measuring the images were filmed, they were not very good. So gradually, over the past 20 years, each of these technical um, limitations of the uh, electron microscopes that are used to do electron cryo microscopy were gradually improved. The, the barriers were overcome, the improvement in um, 
efficiency signal to noise ratio were improved and probably the turning point came 2012 when a new generation of direct electron detectors came in and these produced better images and these better images took advantage of all the technical improvements in the electron microscopes and encouraged the people who were writing computer programs to process these images and calculate 3D structures from the images. And so you had a synergistic um, intersection of a variety of powerful methods. And so from about 2012, people suddenly started to get very high resolution structures, whereas before they were low resolution. So now this field of single particle electron cryomicroscopy has become um, very popular, even among people who knew nothing about it before. So what happens now is somebody says, uh, you know, I've been trying to determine this particular protein structure for 10 years. I've been purifying it, I've been studying it, I've been trying to crystallize it, but I haven't succeeded. My crystals either don't form or they form, but they are poorly ordered and you can't, you can't get a structure. And they say, perhaps I should try electron cryomicroscopy. Cryo-EM, we call it for short. And they will go down, they've spent years doing this, and they will take a very tiny quantity, a few drops of their sample, put it on a grid, do the Dubochet method where you blot it and plunge freeze it, put it in an electron microscope, take images, uh, which are digitized now with the new detectors, compute the structure, and within a few days, they've determined the structure they've spent 10 years trying to do by other methods. So uh, people who've been, of course, working in the field for a long time knew this was coming, but it has turned out to be more successful than, than we thought it would be. And as a result, people who now have no background at all can come in and simply follow the procedure and then succeed in getting structures. So it's become a kind of um, like the gold rush in, in America where people discovered gold and they would go out and make their fortune. So now uh, there are well-established people who know what they're doing, there are people who've been uh, learning it, but there are also newcomers who treat the whole system as a black box. They make the grids, they take the images, they process them, using procedures that have been worked out and written down, and then they, they can see, succeed. And this is the goal of all of the people. It was the goal originally of the people who were sequencing DNA to make it so simple and easy to do that uh, people with no background can do it successfully. And so now, single particle electron cryo microscopy uh, is very successful, and there are now many structures from very large viruses, hundreds of megadaltons, down to small subcellular assemblies like the ribosome or the spliceosome, molecular machines that are underlying all the processes of life, to proteins that are in membranes that transport, for example, the ATPase molecules that synthesize all the ATP, right down to small enzymes or uh, receptors that are involved in generation, the conversion of normal cells to cancer cells and so on. So there are people using these tools uh, to get uh, analytical data on important biological processes that can affect uh, human health, for example. So I think the uh, single particle electron cryo microscopy is now uh, adding to uh, the power of the other methods in structural biology and in biology generally. I should say um, two things about the current status of uh, electron cryo microscopy. Uh, one is that although many people are extremely happy with it and they just want to use it as a method, so it's just fitting into the spectrum of powerful methods that people use, we are not yet into a situation where we've reached the end of the line. There are half a dozen different uh, remaining barriers to progress which, if we can solve them and overcome them, will make it even more powerful than it is at the moment. For example, the detectors we have, although they're much better than film, uh, they are only about 50% equivalent to detecting half of the electrons. The signal to noise ratio can be increased by a factor of two. Um, there is a problem which um, many people are concerned about, but very few people are working on, which is that you put the, the beam on the specimen, bonds break, electrons are knocked out, the specimen gets charged up, the, the specimen is changing as you take an image, and that blurs the images. And this beam-induced 
movement and charging is a fundamental problem. And you know, we're working on it, a few other people are working on it. If, if the images could be made to minimize that uh, beam damage, it would be much more powerful. Other people are working on um, the equivalent of in optical microscopy, there is something called a Zernike phase plate, which um, introduces uh, a phase change in the direct beam compared to the scattered beams. We have um, prototypes that work and can be shown to work in principle, but they're not yet easy to use. So these uh, phase plates are another way forward. Then all the electron lenses in the electron microscope are the equivalent of of non-achromats, so basically 15th century optical microscopy before the achromatic lens uh, was, uh, was invented, which allows red and blue light to be focused at the same point. There's a range of, of um, topics like that. Uh, others include specimen preparation, which once those are solved, electron cryomicro, single particle electron micro cryomicroscopy will go from being a powerful method that many people are happy with to a real world beater. So we're all of us who work in this area, we are very enthusiastic and very optimistic about it. So the future, if you like, is very bright in this area. There is one thing that um, we should perhaps mention, and that is that uh, many of the thing, many of the structures and the um, the problems in biology are now quite well analyzed and quite well understood. Um, and obviously methods like single particle cryo-EM, electron cryotomography and so on, will contribute uh, to that understanding. Um, but it's likely that there will be an end to structural biology as a sort of uh, really frontier-like technique because in biology there are only a certain number of structures. For example, in the human genome you only have 20 or 25,000 genes. We probably know the structures of half of these molecules. So in five or ten years we're going to have a pretty good understanding of the, the three-dimensional structures, not just the genetics and the protein sequences, but the three-dimensional structures of everything in biology. And so then the frontier will move. Uh, structural biology will be a technique that you use to understand biology. You'll still have to uh, get to the bottom of how the brain works, what's the molecular basis of consciousness. Uh, some cancers will be difficult to understand. So there, there are untold numbers of problems still in, 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 in the future. And then my own view is that once you have discovered uh, everything in reasonable detail so that most people are happy, you can still go on to invent things. So although there's a limit to the number of things in biology that can be discovered, it's a finite world, if you like. It's a bounded universe. Beyond that, you can invent anything you can think of. So uh, my own view is that uh, science and structural biology, molecular biology, uh, you know, human biology will change from an era where you are most people in this lab still, it used to be everyone was discovering and no one was inventing. Only, only techniques were being invented. Now it's probably about 75, 25. Quite a lot of people are focused on inventing new therapies. Monoclonal antibodies is a good example. You, you can now, there are now, it's now a hundred billion a year business. If you have certain types of cancer or certain virus infections, you can be treated with a monoclonal antibody, it completely cures you. So these are inventions. They were not naturally occurring. They were invented by humans targeting particular things. So I think there, there will be a change from discovery uh, uh, gradually, one after another, and people will start companies and so on. It will change from discovery to invention. And then, there's, then, there's, then it's limitless. You can invent any, any number of things in the future. <laughs>